Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to wait a couple minutes. I know people are are trickling in here. Um, so give us a minute or two and and we will uh, we'll get kicked off. So excited, uh, excited to jump into this topic with you all today. All right, I think we should. Uh, I think we can go ahead and get kicked off. I'm sure people will trickle in still, but um, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Um, excited to talk about AI agents with you all. Um, so, if you haven't met me, my name is Ryan Francis. I'm the president uh, here and one of the partners here at Launchpad Lab. Uh, background is I used to be a developer. Uh, tend to focus a little bit more on technology strategy these days. Um, personally, very. Um, uh, very passionate about AI. You know, the last couple of years, really since ChatGPT came out back in 2022, I was actually looking at, you know, when it came out, it's been basically exactly two years. Uh, what, what's that? Okay, switching the camera. Uh, can people see us? <laughs> okay. Are we good? I think we're good, right? I think she's saying just stop sharing. This is, why Stop we do, this is why okay. we do it live. There we go. How's that? All right. Anyway, long story short, two years ago, ChatGPT came out. And I think, um, you know, for me personally, it definitely was a wake up moment of, okay, we're, we're in the AI age. Uh, and I think, um, you know, for Ryan here, it might have been a little bit earlier than that. I know you've been involved in generative yeah. AI for over 10 years. Uh, um, 12 years, 2013. Uh, I joined a company called Narrative Science, which I think at the time was the only generative AI company in the world. So I, I kind of joke and say that I was the first uh, generative AI salesperson <laughs> in the world. I, I can't really prove or disprove that statement, but uh, it certainly gives me some credibility, I think, in conversations when I say it. But uh, yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been quite a journey. I think 2022 is really kind of the big tipping point when all this work in AI finally became highly useful to many, many people. So I think that's what we're uh, going to talk about today. Yeah. So, and, and I think it's very rare to find someone that has over a decade of experience in the generative AI world. Um, I think for most of us, you know, maybe three, you know, two, three years, uh, and most of the experts that uh, I talk to, they have, you know, less than five years experience. There's not a lot of people that have been in this space for over 10 years. So I think you have a lot of, you know, a lot to offer on just kind of your perspective, having been involved in generative AI for like over 10 years. Um, I'd love to maybe just start off, Ryan, with, you know, in, introduce yourself, maybe yeah. talk about your journey, you know, starting with narrative science, you know, in the Salesforce, maybe we, we start there. Yeah, I guess the, the caveat is I'm, I'm not technical in the sense that I'm a developer. So most of my career in this space has been working with uh, executives that were looking to implement AI almost always for the very first time. So a lot of it was becoming a guide, becoming that kind of trusted advisor of senior people looking to make an investment and have hopefully a positive outcome with value from, from AI. Uh, I think the main evolution, if you look at it backwards, today we really have this agentic platform with Salesforce and others, other companies where uh, we've got large language models powering role-based and job-based apps, essentially, that can uh, really take the place of a lot of the work that people don't want to be doing uh, to free up individuals to, you know, do what they do best. Uh, rewinding even further, the large language model effort, that, that had been going on for many decades. And up until 2022, early 2023, it just was not good enough. Uh, to add value. It was uh, very good at producing ra random uh, series of words and letters that uh, uh, to developers that were building it were impressive, but to the rest of us in business and the real world, it just didn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, we crossed that threshold uh, early 2023. And prior to that, 
most of generative AI that was actually being deployed, which is what I was doing, uh, were what I would call small language models or language models that you would configure for a very specific use case. You would basically build it from the ground up, uh, not with massive data sets or massive sets of knowledge. Rather, you're actually creating a set of rules uh, around a data model to do something very specific, like take a spreadsheet of data, and write me a financial report. Great, now do that 100,000 times a year because the data set's pretty much the same and the rules are pretty much the same. Um, that was not a very scalable business. It took uh, weeks, if not months, to actually stand up what I would call an AI agent for a particular purpose. Uh, and you needed a data engineer, you had to have a prompt engineer, uh, and then obviously working with subject matter experts to make sure the output was um, useful. And, and now, uh, someone like me who's not technical, I can use Agent Forces platform. I can play around with our studio to build out an agent for, you know, selling a product or providing customer service. I can do that by myself, uh, you know, in the span of less less than an hour. Uh, so I think um, the evolution has felt long to me, uh, but it's felt, I think, very fast to people who haven't been spending the last 12 years uh, in this space. So. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I, no, I mean, I, I think that's spot on. I mean, it's uh, you have this sort of sh tectonic shift in both capability of the underlying model, but then also ease of deployment. I think one of the things that I've seen over the last two years, you know, ChatGPT mm -hmm. comes out November of 22, and that was sort of the start of this new kind of wave. But what we're seeing now is the result of this scaffolding that's been built over right. the last two years. I think Salesforce has invested obviously tons of energy in, in creating scaffolding on top of these large language models. Um, and, and I think that's really where businesses can start to see the value in the underlying LLMs is when you know they start to utilize something like Salesforce that has built a lot of scaffolding to make those large language models a easy to sort of bring into their workflow, bring into their uh, you know, bring into their service teams, their sales teams, their marketing teams, uh, but B, like kind of take care of all the stuff around security and guardrails and right. uh, grounding and all this kind of stuff. So to me, I think what's exciting about Salesforce and what you guys are doing with Agent Force in, in particular is this sort of scaffolding that you've erected over the last two years on top of these powerful large language models. Um, so I think, why don't we talk a little bit about Agent Force? Yeah. Maybe you could just give the audience like kind of a primer on, especially if folks haven't really heard of Agent Force, just a primer on, you know, A, what are AI, what are agents? How is that different from say ChatGPT? And what is Agent Force? Yeah, I think to maybe zoom out before we get into kind of the Salesforce piece of it, uh, the, the main thing that I think prevented large language models and ChatGPT from being enterprise grade or adopted by a lot of businesses uh, was two things. One, you have to put these things somewhere in, in the flow of work. So ChatGPT obviously exists uh, outside of most business systems that people use today, whether that's CRM or their HR systems, uh, mm -hmm. finance systems, whatever those are. So we weren't really placing these language models somewhere that business people were spending most of their time. And on the back end, uh, there's not a data model connected to large language models that's specific to your business unless you either custom plug in a data model into a large language model, or in Salesforce's case, we're actually just integrating the LLM uh, into the place that literally tens and tens of millions of people, they go every day to log in for uh, their sales work, their marketing work, um, collaboration with Slack, their analytics work with Tableau. Uh, so I think with Agent Force, we're essentially, like you said, scaffolding. We're not requiring uh, any business to build something new. You don't need to custom train a model. There's no custom integration required. We're just plugging it in pretty much everywhere so that uh, the jobs that people use Salesforce products to do day in, day out, y you can now augment a whole bunch of the tasks that I would say most of the time people don't want to do anyway. You can now automate and augment that work uh, using Agent Force. So these are purposed built, purpose-configured uh, agents that all of our clients can set up inside of Salesforce uh, where the large language model 
all of the compliance uh, standards like SOC 2 and all the different regulatory standards, all of that is built in. So if you've already signed, you know, a security agreement uh, where you've signed off on Salesforce's security protocols, uh, there's not like in another layer you have to sign off on to use Agent Force. It's already um, meeting all of those standards. So um, in the more in the most boring way, we've basically figured out all the plumbing, all the regulatory, all the legal stuff, um, the integration points so that our clients don't have to. Um, so large language models are powering every agent force, um, you know, capability that we're, we're coming to market with. Yeah. And I think, I think probably one of the questions that, you know, for me as a business owner, uh, when I look at through my own lens as a business owner of, you know, am I going to release a, an, a customer facing agent? I think one of the concerns I hear and, and would have myself in that lens is, you know, is this agent going to be good enough to represent my brand? Is it going right. to be good enough to, um, to, to give my customers a good experience? Um, I think we've all probably had experiences with chatbots at this point that have been subpar. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, certainly the chatbots pre GPT, uh, were pretty bad. You know, those rule-based kind of chatbots were, you know, where you're just like, you know, if you're on the phone, you're just hitting zero a thousand times. Or if you're on the chat, you're like, let me talk to a human. Um, you know, I, I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about like, do we think we've reached a level of quality here where, um, these agents can, can deliver a great experience in a customer facing capacity. I don't know if you want to share any thoughts on that. I definitely have some thoughts on it as well, but yeah, I, I think you should spend most time talking about this because you're the technical person that understands <laughs> the, oh. the un, under the hood. But uh, no, I, I think the one thing I would just state before you jump in, uh, you have to ask yourself, like, what are you comparing to? Uh, if you're comparing it to old school chat bots, no question. Obviously, that hurdle is, is pretty low to jump over. Uh, if you're comparing will a AI agent have higher quality at scale than a person or a team of people? Uh, I think you have to just define the problem you're looking to solve because people don't scale well. Um, training individuals to follow your brand and represent your brand at scale, that's very difficult. I mean, you've got good support people, you've got bad support people, you've got really good call center, um, contact center reps, you've got people who aren't as good. Um, I think the one thing with the AI agent is when you get it to a level of quality that you, you believe is good, that is the quality that every single experience that you will give your customers consistent. It's consistent right? at scale. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the bar we have to get over. But as far as technically speaking, I think you should jump into that. Yeah. No. I. I mean, that's that's fair. And I. I think um, what I've seen with these deployments in the past, with you know pre, I would say pre agent force, because a lot of folks were trying to do these chatbots early on before the scaffolding really existed that agent force is providing now. But what I saw a lot of times was. Um, these agents not really having the same knowledge, information, context that a human would have performing that same role. And so one, one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind when you're when you're trying to deploy a, let's say, let's just use like customer service as an example, you're trying to deploy a service agent, um, you got to kind of think about and imagine that the AI agent you're um, hiring is like a new employee. Like it comes right. with, you know, these agents come with raw you know, intelligence, IQ, you know, they're, they're beating humans on, a, you know, almost every st standardized test at this point, which is pretty crazy. So they have this like raw IQ, but they lack some very critical things that you have to feed it. You know, one would be context and knowledge about your organization, about how, how that customer support agent does its job. Yeah. You know, another would be data access, right? Like, um, you know, if a customer is reaching out to check in on their order, you know, that agent needs to be able to access the database of orders, right? right? To go search that order, find it, and then be able to actually service the customer. So I think, I think what's really intriguing to me about agent force is that in order for the agent to have the same context, the same data access, like you need that customer data yep. to be accessible by the agent. And so having the agent be in Salesforce, Accessing that Salesforce data, I think, is a pretty um, game-changing architecture to enable like actually good service experiences and and other you know um, other type of uh, agent experiences like sales, for example, as well. But um, so and and we could probably talk a little bit more about like some of the challenges that come in when when doing that technically. But um, yeah, I, don't, I, I guess like Ryan, I'd be kind of curious to hear too from you on. You know, when you think about the sort of the raw, 
the raw underlying capability just kind of for you personally, like, do you have more, would you say people in general have more or less confidence in it than you do? And, you know, any tips for people to get more comfortable, you know, with? Yeah. Uh, I think for me, the, the confidence level that our client base in the market, um, it's rapidly accelerating because Normally, when companies like Salesforce launch a product, there'll be kind of like a multiple month lag where we announce something and we say, hey, within three months, you can start testing it or, you know, the release will be next quarter. We launched Agent Force at the exact same time that we announced it uh, at Dreamforce. I think we had 10,000 uh, agents built or 10,000 people building agents. So uh, the best way to gain confidence in my mind is just go build it, go build one yourself uh, and you'll see for yourself um, how good these things are and how uh, easy it is using Salesforce to spin these things up. Um, you can do it for free, meaning if you have the version of Salesforce that is the enterprise grade version, we don't charge for you to go in and actually build out uh, agents yourself. So I guess that's that's one thing is don't take my word for it. I, I can't tell you exactly how your company should use agents. Uh, every company is a bit different, but uh, if your business has not started building out proof of concepts already, uh, then you're probably behind. Uh, but if you want to get that confidence, um, and honestly, just figure out maybe where there are gaps, because if there are use cases that aren't good fits for agent force today, my guess is it's likely due to either you've not loaded or connected the right data into the data cloud infrastructure, uh, or potentially it's a use case that's fairly high risk, meaning, uh, something in banking or something in healthcare, um, you know, something in government where you're interacting with people around their taxes and how much money they get back. Um, anywhere where someone's really going to have a high leverage moment with an agent, uh, just a different level of obviously testing and trust needs to go into that. Um, but there is hundreds of, of use cases today that uh, you could investigate and start launching that don't kind of fit that mold of a, a high risk type use case. Yeah, I actually have a slide. I just pulled this up. Uh, cause you're talking about sort of what are some of the criteria you got to think about when you're trying to figure out where do we start with this? Where's a good place within the company to maybe put some AI yeah. and, dri and drive some, some value. Um, so, you know, at Launchpad, we, we, we have a framework that we use. Uh, we've been using this the last couple of years as we've been doing these AI projects. And it's, it's really a four step process. And, and the start of it is this like work selection process. How do you, you have all this work happening in your business and you're trying to augment that work with AI where do you start? How do you pick the right work for the AI to tackle? Um, and I, th I think within that work selection, there, there's there's really like kind of six, I mean, there's a variety of criteria, but six key criteria that we found um, you sort of have to look at and assess to figure out, is it a good case for AI yep. or, or maybe not a good case? Um, and so you mentioned risk. We actually have that on here, risk, right? Like, you, you know, if you have a situation, uh, uh, you know, potential work that is high risk, you're dealing with maybe someone's um, life on the line, or, yeah. you know, super high risk scenario, you know, think healthcare. And, uh, you know, I know in finance, oftentimes, there's some yeah. high risk scenarios there. Um, but I think outside of risk, there's, you know, the first thing that you have to look at, I, I think is like, complexity. So um, you, you, we want to look for cases where it actually requires intelligence, right? Because if, if intelligence is not really needed, if you can actually pre-program a set of rules, right. what, I, what I've found is that it, it's probably cheaper to just pre-program the rules um, because of the fact that you know these AI models do use like a lot of computes. So just to make, so you're saying like in an app, if there's a button that you build, you want to know exactly what's going to happen when you click that button. It's it's 100% certain every time, cheaper, safer, just program it instead of having like Correct. AI drive that customer journey or something. Yeah, and I think like service is a great example of something that requires intelligence. You have a yeah. case a request coming in and that request is, you know, the way it's typed out is never going to be the same. Someone's right. just typing in, hey, I need help or whatever. And that and so you need intelligence to process that request to understand what they're asking in the context of what they're asking. But yeah, exactly. Like a button, you know, where uh, uh, someone inside your company is hitting a button and yeah. something's happening and, and it's always the same flow you know, probably makes sense to just program yeah. that, right? Um, when, when I saw this slide the first time, I think the way I interpreted it, kind of when I, again, zoom out, if it's a good case for AI and you're saying it's a bad case for AI on the right-hand side, to me, I read 
the right hand side is it's still good for a human. So like this is how you should be looking at. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like if right. it's if it's a good Not- case for AI or it's a bad case for if it's bad for AI today, that means leave that work to humans. But um, when I when I do talk to executives and this to me this is like a CEO level conversation because they're having to think about how do we transform our company over the next five, 10 years yeah. when you can take all this work that our company does and you can bundle together mm. all the work AI can do into agents, whether that's one agent with multiple skills or m- many different agents that have their own kind of discrete skills. There's a whole bunch of work that we're just going to say, let the AI agents do it because you know how much it's going to cost. It's probably a transaction type fee per transaction for each kind of experience with AI. So from a uh, finance perspective, you know exactly how much that work's going to cost you. Right. And as that work goes up over time, the model of that is, it, it's actually probably going to get cheaper over time. Yeah. Right? right. Because competing models and all the different uh, data centers that Elon and others Moore's are building. Moore's law, Moore's law yeah. right? So the cost mm-hmm. of that capital is going to be coming lower and lower. Um, yeah, yeah. But there's almost always going to be work that we should be thinking of as human work, yeah. Uh, especially today, because I think this is very futuristic part of the conversation. But um, I, I love this criteria and this framework because I think it's a good way for people to think about what should we leave today for people, but where should we be hyper aggressive in just finding tasks that we can kind of hand over to AI agents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think this intelligence one is is the reason I put this in here is that. I think a lot of people think, okay, the AI is going to take the stuff that doesn't require intelligence. Like the, re- but I would actually argue that you know if you have stuff that really doesn't require any intelligence, you probably should just pre-program that. It'll be cheaper for you. It'll be more consistent. Uh, it's not a probabilistic system. It's just a rule-based. Um, and so you actually do want to look for the things that require intelligence, but you're you're yeah. looking for within that within that um, you're also looking at the things that are more task size. So not necessarily having an AI agent go perform a whole project for you, right? but more so- Like a multi-step. Like a, a task would be, you know, in yeah. the case of service, a case comes in, we need to resolve the case. That's a task. Resolve the case is a, is a task, right? Versus a project might be, go figure out how to grow the business 10% or something. Um, so I think like this, this framework has been really good for us in, in how we're sort of looking for good cases for AI, you know, look for where there's intelligence needed, it's task size where there's frequency, because frequency, you know, what that translates to is value. Like if you have this thing happening a lot, you have a lot right. of cases coming in every month and you can you can take a lot of those cases off your team's yeah. plate, that's gonna have a lot of value, right? Um, same with the time consuming, the the duration of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, as, as it relates to the service agent, you know, I think that's why Agent Force probably was, I'm speaking for you a little bit here, but why you guys launched maybe the service agent first yeah. is such a good candidate for this because, you know, complexity is, is high. You need intelligence. The tasks, it is task size stuff. You're, you're, dealing, you're dealing with cases, right? Um, you do have frequency here. Um, you know, lots of support cases that that businesses have to have to resolve and deal with. Um, they can be time consuming. Like it can be a lot of work to resolve those cases, a lot of back and forth with the customer, yep. Um, and usually support teams have good documentation. Usually they've kind of defined, here's our, here's our guidebook on customer support. Um, so yeah, I think, I think like service agents from my perspective are, are a really good low hanging fruit for this technology. I think agent force being, I mean, went GA, what, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, something like that. Uh, it's a really great time to, to jump into this and and build out a service agent with, with Salesforce. Yeah. I think the the principles of what a good use case are to start with haven't changed in the 12 years that, I, that I've been doing this. Uh, high volume of repetitive tasks is is one, but also where do you have a lot of people doing the same thing right. over and over and over and over again? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, because if you can free them up, what you find is the best people will start to you know take on more work or they'll take on more complex work. And if you free them up from the stuff they don't want to do, burnout goes down, quality of work goes up, creativity goes up. You find out, hey, let's actually run this process differently because I've had time and energy to actually think about the process instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, I'd also say that companies that sell a lot of the same thing or a lot of products in the same homogenous category, those are good examples. Like if you sell cars or 
real estate or insurance, um, the amount of variability across your client base is going to be a lot lower mm. than a business that sells hundreds of different products across dozens of different categories, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because it's hard to build one agent, even using large language models that can handle so much complexity and do it for every category that you operate in. So mm-hmm. um, I think those are just some principles of how to identify a good use case. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Do I, we want to, um, Larry was saying we should show our face on camera. I feel like we have a podcast where we've got you know a producer in the background. This is new to Ryan and I. Uh, so L- Larry's saying show our face. So our, show our faces, okay. <laughs> People don't want to see our faces, right? Yeah. Maybe your face. Um, yeah, so uh, I, 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 think, I, I think one... Um, topic that might be interesting for folks is, you know, I know you spent the last couple of years at Tableau. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, everyone's kind of heard of the service agent use case, but I, I think you and I have seen some more interesting yeah. use cases over the last couple of years or more, more uh, out of the box use cases, if you will. Yeah. Maybe talk about some of the things that you're seeing just in terms of data analytics and, uh, and, and sort of the data analyst agent use case. Yeah. So I think, Again, zooming out, uh, if you look at the world of analytics, um, the best platforms, um, Tableau and others, you know, at most they're able to get 30% of a business using their tools on any given day or week, right? Uh, and, and it's not because people don't care about data or they don't need data to do their job. Mainly it's because the interface that we give people, it's just not intuitive. There's, there's a, a hurdle you have to cross to figure out, okay, how do I discover what's going on in this data set, or how do I interact with this visualization? Uh, they're they're not necessarily interfaces that are designed for, you know, the executive or a manager, somebody on the front line, you know, that's on the floor of a, a factory or a sales floor. Um, those tools aren't necessarily built for them, and so I think the big opportunity that agents provide in the the insight world is how do we give people information, and I I use the word information, not data, uh, in a form that is natural to them, that will just show up wherever they already spend their time, uh, and do so in a way that will just, that will just make sense. So instead of asking people, you know, hey, go learn more data skills, go, go learn how to use Tableau, or take this training, we're actually saying, let's just make the systems easier. So I'm not saying make them dumber, but let's let's bring the machine that's giving all the insight mm-hmm. and let's bring the machine closer to the business user instead of asking the business user to um, learn or go somewhere they don't really want to go. Uh, so in, in our world, uh, you know, Tableau's always been on the forefront of investing in AI. I mean, they, they bought the company I was at, Narrative Science, three years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they've had very good natural language processing capabilities. They've launched Tableau Pulse. Um, where I think this is going, and, and Tableau Agent is now in the process of being released, uh, is, is a couple of places. One, every aspect of Tableau will be composable and portable, meaning uh, we call it headless BI. So mm. uh, in Tableau, you can prep data, you can load data, you can bring it into the interface, and then you can build a visualization. Uh, maybe you're just someone who needs to view data, uh, and you have to log into you know, a spreadsheet, or sorry, into a dashboard and see it, or maybe it's embedded somewhere that you already work. Uh, with headless BI, all that can be completely stripped away, and Tableau can just show up when you need it, where you need it. So if I'm sitting inside a Slack and um, you know I'm a managing director of a management consulting firm, Tableau might just track data for me, for all my clients and tell me, hey, something's going on in this account uh, and uh, there's a lot of momentum happening at the data level. We think you should know about it. Cool, okay. Well, what's driving that change? Let me just tell you. And so to me, it's just like a person in Slack telling me what's going on inside of my accounts and instead of just giving me the insights, it's also going to say, I've got three ideas of what you could do about this. Uh, you could, uh, you know, I'll sh- actually we have a demo we can show here. You can pull it up. Yeah, let me um, get that pulled up. But I, I think that's what really excites me is kind of integrating the analytics workflow into the rest of the world uh, instead of asking people to come in. Uh, here we go. Yeah, let me share this yeah, here. Okay, we have a demo. Awesome. So this is the that. example I was showing you where... 
a managing director. I manage the automotive sector. And on my Slack app, on my phone, before I get on a flight, it tells me, you know, something's going on inside of the Ford Motor account. So you have, so this was a basically a notification saying, exactly. hey, Ford, Ford uh, uh, the account health has in- improved. 15%. Exactly. Okay. Tableau's keeping track of metrics for me. It tells me when something's going on. It then brings me into a Slack channel. And so the AI agent has teed up already uh, this metric. So it's saying um, the score for Ford has gone up and it's being driven by a couple of things. So it's a multi-factor analytic, basically, where it's looking at multiple things. One, white paper downloads for this account, they're increasing. That's pretty interesting. I kind of knew that already. Uh, There's news headlines that are increasing. I'm paying attention to that as well. But it looks like there was actually a new hire that runs for its supply chain that just started. That's driving the score higher. That's very interesting. So the agent's gonna give me the option to learn more about that. So I'm gonna say, hey, do some research on my behalf. So it's gonna search LinkedIn, the internet, wherever kind of uh, you want it to go look. And it's gonna come back and tell you, um, we didn't just search third-party data, we actually checked your CRM. There's a partner at your firm that has a relationship with this guy uh, and the partner's name's Lindsay. Do you wanna talk to Lindsay about that? Great. So you can kind of see how this workflow is going beyond just telling me something interesting and it's giving me the next step without having to go anywhere else. It's right in the workflow. Yeah. So you just went from, first of all, you had this like proactive agent who was on the lookout, on the hunt for some type of an insight. It figured out, okay, hey, your account Ford improved in account health. Let's see, yep. here, here are the reasons why. And through that, it also drove an insight to you around, hey, there's this new, um, employees start in there, like, and you have a connection, mutual connection inside yep. your company to that employee. Let's connect you guys and get, so, I mean, that is incredible. Yeah. Right? I, and I yeah. think, uh, comparing maybe where we were a couple of years ago with chatbots to today, this is an example of an AI agent that is multi-skilled, right? So it started off as a data right. analyst. So it's giving me an insight by tracking metrics and Tableau, but then it's saying, Hey, I can actually introduce you to another person on your team, almost like an executive assistant would. Do you want me to create a channel or set a meeting? It can also do research for me. So it's going out and looking at the internet and pulling back only the relevant information that I need. So with Salesforce, because we have the data cloud on the Mm -hmm. back end, uh, it's able to kind of combine so many different skills into one experience where Mm -hmm. we're not going into different databases. We're not going into different systems because the whole platform is Salesforce, all of the data is in one place in data cloud. Uh, This experience feels like kind of a super agent that has multiple skills all in one place. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, it's definitely, I I think that's a good call out with data cloud and just like, to me, I think the architecture that they've set up with agent force really hits the nail on the head. Yep. Just as far as like, you know, to me, the three ingredients actually have a slide on this somewhere too. Yeah, maybe just to close the demo out. Um, Let's do that first. The demo is almost done. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, the other skill that this agent has, it's, it's actually a, call it like a sales development rep or a marketing analyst. Uh, it, it's going to take basically all the information we know about John and it's going to write an email that I can send. Mm. Um, although it doesn't look perfect, I give the agent some feedback. I'd like to invite John to some webinars. It's going to rewrite that email for me. And now I can just send the email directly in here. So, hmm. you know, from insight directly through me doing research and then contacting this person with the perfect email, that's maybe five minutes, Right all because we combine different skills into this one agent experience. And I think for Tableau, some clients are gonna have Tableau agents where they're gonna use Tableau agents to build out dashboards, create experiences that are very analytic focused. I think more common is you're gonna see other agents that just have like an analytic skill that's part of their overall capability set. It's not necessarily an analytic agent, but we're gonna give another agent just the ability to do analysis using Tableau powering on the back end. That's what we're seeing a lot of already um, working with other teams for our clients. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like this is going to allow for more democratization of uh, of, da- of data analysis because sure. basically you don't have to know how to go construct a SQL query or yep. do join tables and stuff like that. Um, I still don't even really know how to do join table, you know, joining tables no. together. I let my developers figure that out. I mean, it, so so I think this has got to be one of the more interesting use cases for business leaders. Yep. Is like, hey. 
can we can I have an AI agent that I can just collaborate with and get insights from? Hey, yep. what's going on with this account? Or I saw a revenue, you know, dipped in this vertical or this like customer base in the last 30 days. Like what's driving yep. that? What what can we do to to course correct that? So definitely think Tableau has a real, really yeah. interesting opportunity connecting Tableau with CRM to yep. do that. I mean, it's really intriguing yeah, for sure. And, and uh, we're going to jump to, we have a lot of questions popping up, which is awesome and crazy because we kind of forget there's people watching this. <laughs> uh, the, I think the last thing that I would say about the Tableau piece is um, before AI agents plus Tableau, um, the way that you would make your company smarter or more data driven is you would pay a lot of money, do a big data project build out a bunch of dashboards, hope people use them, right? Yeah. Uh, with AI agents, you, you can now basically inject knowledge directly inside your company without having anybody change anything they're doing. Everyone just keep doing what you're doing. Knowledge and insight will just show up where you work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think cool. if you look at kind of the research, the companies that actually are the most data-driven, they outperform the companies that aren't financially speaking. So this seems like pretty low-hanging fruit to spend a little bit of money upgrade your Tableau license, get an AI agent, and now your whole company is more data-driven. Um, that will help you in market for sure. Um, I cannot believe how many questions we have. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, why don't we, let me, let me. Um, I see, think one of these questions is really good. So uh, all these questions are good, but uh, I was going to talk through this anyway. Um, you guys see any, any examples of agents being able to pull data from external platforms I'm sure this may be possible, but under the hood, would this be an API call each time? Uh, you know, how do you basically give agents access to information? And, and I think this does kind of come into um, one one sort of topic I wanted to to talk about. Let me see if I can share my screen again. Where did this get? Let's just bring this over here. Uh, let's see. There it is. Demo threw me off here. You can tell we do these webinars all the time. Yeah, this is uh, this is a work in progress here. <laughs> um, okay, so are you sharing your screen or is that just a slide? Not uh, yet. Here we go. Share. Now we got it. Okay, so drop back here. So th this slide here, I think, is really critical. So when you're when when you in order to make an AI agent that is actually successful, I think you've got to do these three steps and you've got to do them really well. And this question about data and data integration is really about giving it access. So I, I mentioned earlier, you have this, you know, think about the AI agent as like, I just hired an employee. They have, you know, maybe this employee is, you know, you really like the talent of the individual, really intelligent, yeah. but now you got to train the employee. Um, so you got to give it knowledge. You got to give it the sort of the context about here's how to go do your job. Um, you know, in the case of service, like that might be a CSR guidebook, right? Here's how you handle certain inquiries. Here's, yeah. how, here's our best practices. Um, this middle one, giving it access, this is really about giving that agent the ability to query data. And that data is probably a lot of it's going to be in Salesforce. But what I've seen so far with my clients is they almost always have data in other places. External data. Yes. And so, so his question was, how do you access that? Is it API or what's, so, what's the... So what Agent Force did that's, I think, really smart is they created this concept of agent actions. It's a very flexible system. So what you can basically do is expose actions to the agent, give them a library of actions that the agent can take. So if it, if a customer is asking for, um, yeah, if a customer is asking for, you know, to check in on the status of their delivery, um, we could have an action, you know, check orders, uh, ch check delivery status. And that action could, could fetch data from Salesforce or could do an API call out to, um, yeah. say, a 3PL API to check on the, you know, check on the, the status and the, and where that order is in transit. Right. Um, and so that actioning system, you know, you can use flows in Salesforce, which flows are super powerful. It's, you know, flows are just this really powerful no code system for creating automations. Yeah. Um, so the fact that you can have that action actually fire off a flow kind of opens up a whole world yeah. of possibilities. Ba based um, on the questions I'm seeing, it sounds like we should do a follow on where we actually do a demo webinar where we actually walk through creating an agent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in, Fair. In, yeah, yeah, no, because I think yeah, there's a lot totally. of questions about how it works. I, the only thing I would add to that is uh, a lot of our clients are now starting to use data cloud. 
where instead of having API calls that would go out um, kind of on real time basis, you can have zero copy um, data sharing set up. So let's say you have a lot of data in Snowflake, you've got a lot of data in Salesforce, maybe you've got some data in Workday or wherever else. Um, you don't have to load your data into Data Cloud, but you can basically set up a zero copy connection where the data actually does not move where it sits. You're just giving sort of secure access in real time to the data cloud infrastructure. So no API calls needed. Um, not every client is in data cloud today, so I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but that is becoming a more common um, kind of data backbone for agent. Uh, agent oh, employees. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think it was smart for that for them to lead off with, because I remember data cloud was the focus you know, maybe a year or two ago, and it, and it was really the lead in and I think a foundational to do agents well, you know, having that data lake concept right there uh, with the vector database um, is definitely important. Um, I, I think, um, you know, with the actions concept too, I, I think there's two different kinds of, of sort of data types of actions, right? You're gonna have read actions, like I need to go get information and that's really where data cloud comes in. Any type of like any data that the agent needs to read, you can have in, in data cloud and, and pulling into that conversation. But there's also gonna be scenarios where the agent needs to go uh, perform right action. Yep. So that might be creating an order or refunding an order. Not, you know, uh, not that you would necessarily want the AI agent automatically refunding orders for you. But, um, you know, I think that's really where um, those flows would come in is you think about data cloud, probably more on the read side and then flows maybe more on the on the act or the right side of things. Yep. Um, let's see. That question is kind of the same one we just answered. Uh, okay, here, here's one. Um, for companies that are maybe in the early days of using, figuring out what they're going to do for Agent Force, what, what, like why Salesforce, I guess, is kind of the short question that the person's asking here. It's like, why, why is Salesforce better than another firm like Microsoft or something else? I'll let you answer that because uh, I'll probably come off too biased. But as a tech consulting firm with a whole lot of companies that you interact with and integrate with, um, like, where do you see the advantages or strengths of Salesforce? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that I think that's there's a couple of things. I, the obvious one and the big one is so many companies have so much of their customer data already in Salesforce. So being able to give that agent uh, act, uh, an easy way to interface with that data in a secure way with the right guardrails and you know masking of mm -hmm. of information before it, it goes into the LLM and things like that, I think. I think it's just a really, it just accelerates time to value. It improves the quality of the system that you are creating. And I think for me, like if you're going to go through the process of creating a service agent, augmenting your team, do it well, you know, set mm -hmm. it up where that agent has the same affordances that you're giving your humans. You know, it has, it has the training, it has the data access, um, and it has the guardrails. And those are the three things that I think Agent Force has done very well is 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 making sure that the system includes all of those. Yeah. I've seen other systems not have all of those things in it or not do those three things really well. So yeah, that that would be my I think that at the end of the day it comes down to customer data and it is critical for the agents to be successful. Salesforce has that data and I think it gives them a, a major leg up. Yeah, I think the only things I would add to that, um one, uh there's always going to be a need for the human expert to know how to set these things up correctly and and um, make sure you're using every piece of agent force to its full ability uh, we have an 11 million person trailblazer community that uh, if you listen to mark benioff he's saying that every single employee every partner everyone's becoming an agent force expert right now right so i think um, there's companies like launchpad that are experts in this already um, and not a lot of other companies in the world building this stuff can say that. Um, but you know, I think you handled that one well. And then uh, there's a question about Tableau. Um, I guess, how would you differentiate the Tableau agent capabilities or AI capabilities relative to Power BI or Microsoft? Um, get that question a lot. Uh, I, I think uh, the easiest way to kind of think of that is everything on the Microsoft um, world, it, they're very disparate products. You know, you've got a CRM product, you've got a cloud product in Azure, you've got an analytics product, you've got, you know, work tools like uh, PowerPoint and Word. They're all very good at very point needs. But if your company needs to kind of blend all these workflows together and 
instead of thinking of software as these separate disparate things that you use for different purposes, and now we're building agents, like I said before, uh, that can basically combine multiple skills into one. Uh, don't just do data analysis, do data analysis and guide my actions, automate my next steps. Um, you really need to have the workflow tied into a platform where a lot of your people work today. Um, and I think that's one of the beauties of Tableau is it's going to be fully integrated throughout Agent Force, and it's going to be fully integrated throughout the CRM platform as well as Slack. So uh, that's a huge leg up. Um, I would also kind of argue that when you have a business like Tableau where we're a separate business unit, you know, we've got thousands of people obsessed with the success of our Tableau customer and Tableau customer user base. Um, other vendors don't necessarily have that. They view analytics as an app, uh, and it's a tool that they give to their customers, but there's not a team of thousands, even hundreds of people um, focused on just that user persona. Uh, and that's not the case with Tableau. We're very obsessed with our customers' uh, success. And like I said, the uh, Tableau bought narrative science, so a lot of our PhD and engineer product people, they're the ones bringing these new agent capabilities to market for Tableau. Um, I forget, are we going to 245 or 250? Uh, I think we got till 245. How are we looking? Oh, we're over. We're over. <laughs> are there any, so, is there any more questions um, for I those think, that have hung on? I think real quick, I just want to quickly mention kind of our process at LPL. If, if anyone is um, looking to kind of move into agent force, kind of what does the flow look like? Um, I can't figure out how to share, share the screen. Here we go. Uh, let's see. I don't know where it went. Um, I can talk through it. So essentially four steps, right? I think, I think it, uh, you talk, I'll look. yeah, you look, okay. First step is really what we would call our, uh, AI automation workshop. And so I think, I think this is really the workshop that we run. It's usually like a half day kind of workshop where we sit down with clients and we just really open up their, their business and look at where their people are, what they're doing. And we help advise on where they should focus their energy as far as um, as far as implementing agent force, usually you know service is the obvious one right now, just with that being GA as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what we can do in this workshop, if a company is interested in service, is we can talk about where do we see the opportunities, the eighty twenty rule within that service experience, where we can really start to augment the service team. And you know, usually that's looking at. I find there's usually ten to fifteen kind of topics that yeah. agents are, are, um, you know, dealing with. Usually that's like, let's pick half of those topics and start to get really good with the, with that half. And that usually can, can handle a lot of the cases. So what, what, what I really advise business owners and, and leaders on is you don't really have to jump right into implementation, right? Like what you want to do is start with a workshop, have a, a consulting firm like Launchpad you know, who can bring that outside perspective, look at your business kind of fresh with fresh yep. eyes and, and suggest where to focus. And then from there, you can build a proof of concept and the proof of concept can be pretty quick. I mean, we're doing these in, uh, you know, three to four weeks and through that proof of concept, you can really get a good sense of, okay, yeah, this is going to be really advantageous yep. and it's going to really take a lot of, the, and, and you can actually run various cases through it. Um, so the, the proof of concept is really where I think for a lot of software projects, you can skip that stage. You go from the workshop into like an implementation for AI projects. I think the proof of concept is really key because yep. you're trying to build confidence and feasibility. You're working with a more probabilistic system than like a deterministic system. Yeah. So I found that proof of concept to be a really good kind of starting point way of, of getting engaged and um, you know, with the agent builder that Salesforce has, it's pretty quick to get a POC stood up. The hardest part is just getting those like data sources connected, getting the, the knowledge, uh, sometimes explicitly written down if it's in people's heads, right. um, you know, or if it's all over the place, a lot of times companies don't have a unified knowledge, uh, experience yet. Um, but then, you know, I think, so you, you have the workshop, you do the POC, go into the implementation. I find that these are, you know, these take a couple months. They're not, they're, you know, I think you can get something that delivers value faster than, than three to four months. But I think to get something where it's like really taking a majority of cases and resolving them uh, at a high degree of quality, uh, it takes, it does take some time to do that well. And it really comes back to the data piece of like yep. getting the data integration right. 
Um, so if you actually have all that data already figured out, if you're really healthy with data, it can be a lot faster on the imp implementation side. Great. And it looks like we ran out of time. Uh, there's no more questions. The last thing I would just leave, because right now everything at Salesforce is about agent force and AI agents. Uh, we have a bunch of kind of mini dream forces coming around the country. I listed those out here. So I would encourage you, if you live nearby to any of these locations, um, take a day, take a few hours. We will be helping uh, people, non-technical and technical, build their own AI agents on site. Uh, and we'll be demonstrating a lot of the new Tableau capabilities uh, and pretty much everything across Salesforce. So um, I would encourage you to um, spend some time either watching online or coming in person. We would love, love to host you. Uh, any parting thoughts? Uh, I don't think so. I appreciate you joining us, Ryan. I yeah. mean, it's uh, it, wealth of knowledge, and uh, you know, uh, thanks thanks for spending the time and sharing all this with the audience here. And yeah, everybody who joined, thank you for uh, for listening in. We appreciate it, and don't hesitate to reach out to me or, or Ryan. And uh, yeah. you know, happy to chat. And so. let's schedule our uh, follow up where we go deep dive on actually showing a demo, building it end to end. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a good next step for sure. So all right, thanks a lot. Sounds good.